Hi, and welcome to another edition of what's coming up this month at Destiny. Serving is a part of our church's DNA. The head of our church, Jesus Christ, set the example when he was here on this earth. And there was a time, if you remember in Mark, when the disciples were arguing amongst them, who's the greatest? And Jesus told them quite clearly that anyone who wants to be the greatest among you must become the least and servant of all. It says quite clearly here in Ephesians 4, for his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected. Every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body when we are built up and made perfect in love. When everybody's contributing, the body is perfected and grows. There's one area of ministry we are needing people in, and that's stewarding. Your know, stewarding is so important. They are the gatekeepers to the house. They are the people who ensure that that meeting runs in the way that God intended it to, by inviting people in, by showing them to their chairs, by protecting the environment within the meeting, and by just making it safe. So let's sign up today. We have the awesome opportunity to gather together outside our city centre building here in Glasgow and to let people know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be the best kept secret in this city. We want everyone to know that we're there for them, that they can come and join us, that we are family. They are just waiting to meet. So come and join us. It will be the end of a freshest week. There'll be lots of activity, lots of buzz, lots of things going on and we need you and we want you to be there with us. Following our church on the street, on the Sunday the 18th, we are all together, one in worship. We had an awesome time last month meeting together in the Shorelands location and just enjoying the presence of God as one big body. And we're gonna be doing the same again. Sunday, the 18th of September, noted in your diaries, Shawlands location, South Side, be there. We have the exciting opportunity to meet together for our family forum. If you're a part of the family here at Destiny, you are invited. This is where we come together to chat and see what's happened in the ministry, in the church over the last few months, and to hear about the vision of where we're going. Sunday the 25th of September, our According to the Pattern, which is our foundation teaching course on what Christianity is and who we are and what we believe as a church, starts. And we're welcoming you, if you've never done that course before, to sign up and attend. It's a fantastic time of fellowship. It's a time where you can speak to the leaders and hear exactly what we as a church believe. For more details, visit our website. God bless you, we love you. Welcome to our Destiny Church Online time together. It's so good to see you. Thank you for tuning in. I know you're gonna be so blessed with what you hear and receive today. As always, there will be leaders there online for you to personally connect with, receive encouragement from, prayer from, 
They're there right the way through to the end of our time together. In a few moments, we're going to turn to the Word, but first, let's join together, lift up the name of Jesus and worship Him. Sue here to pray with you today. Jeremiah 3, 22 is a scripture God gave me at one season when one of my family were away from the Lord. It literally says, return all of you who have turned away from the Lord. He will heal you and make you faithful. You know, you need to realize that the Lord already speaks. He gives encouragement. He puts out his promises and affords us something concrete that we can pray over and believe for. We can use this scripture to pray for those who are backslidden, or maybe you yourself today are away from God. You're just considering coming back. Realize and know for sure that the Lord wants you. He's drawing you, he's speaking to you, he's encouraging you. He sent me to come and say these words so that you can make that decision again. When it says here, he'll heal you, it means he's gonna fix things repair you, bring you back into recovery and meet your need. Let me pray for you if you want to come back to the Lord today. Father, I pray for those who either are backslidden and away from you 
or those who've friends or family and they wish they'd come back to faith in Jesus. Pray, Lord, that you'd restore them. Pray that you'd heal the situation. Turn them around, help them, give them courage and confidence. Give them determination, Father. Give them that sense of purpose that you specifically are speaking to them in this situation. Lord, I pray that your grace would go with them to help them in every new day of this change of journey, that you'd help them in their relationships, you'd help them in the choices that they make. You'd meet those needs and bless them abundantly. Thank you, Lord, that you draw to us and you draw us to yourself, should I say. You bring us close and you make things good. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sue, for leading us in that prayer moment. It's so good to pray together. So we're going to turn to our moment now where we bring our tithes and our offerings in. Let me encourage you with this verse. Ephesians 4 verse 10 in the CEV version says this, the one who went deep into the earth is the same one who went into the highest heaven so he would fill the whole universe. In the Passion Translation it reads, the same one who descended is also the one who ascended above the heights of heaven in order to begin the restoration and fulfillment of all things. Do you know that Christ Jesus went to the very depths of the earth, to the pit of hell, to deal with the things that we would struggle with in life? He went to pay the full price to release us, to redeem us from all of the curse. But he didn't stay there. The Bible then says he ascended to the highest place. He is above all. He is far above the world systems, every principality and power, every name, every title. He is far above and we are seated in him, in Christ Jesus, so that we can now benefit from everything that Christ Jesus is and has. He ascended so that he would be able to fill the earth. And that word fill means to cram, furnish, satisfy, supply, complete and fulfill. He wants to fulfill every need, desire, want that you have. He wants to cram full your life with good things. He paid the price in the pit so that you would not have to rely on your own resources. You wouldn't have to rely on the world and what it can offer. Christ Jesus, who is far above, is all that you need. He is your source of every good thing. He earned that right by going down, being raised up for us, for us. So as we give, as we sow into the kingdom of God today, as we release our tithes, our 10%, we're saying, Lord, you're our source. You are the one we look to, to fill our lives and cram our lives with every good thing. You are the one we rely on. Let's give together in Jesus' name.
Let's pray over our giving. Father God, we thank you that we can trust you, rely on you, that you are so good to us. And Lord, as everyone has given, Lord, we bring this offering and these tithes before you. They're yours. Lord, we pray that they would be released into exactly where you want them to go. And Lord, for everyone that is given, Lord, would you bless them, increase them, multiply them and meet every need far and above all they could think or imagine. That is the God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'm going to read the scripture before Pastor Andrew comes with the word. And I'm reading from 2 Kings 6, verse 15 to 23 in the New American Standard. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, this is hopeless, my master. What are we to do? And he said, do not be afraid for those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek and he brought them to Samaria. When they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set bread and water before them so that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he provided a large feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master and the marauding bands of the Arameans did not come again into the land of Israel. Here's Pastor Andrew with the word. Hey, great to see you. Welcome to Destiny Church Online with me, Andrew Owen. We're in the middle of an exciting series. I think it's a really important one and we've called it Made in His Image. We're talking really about growing as a Christian. And some of the things we pointed out is this, that God is far more interested in what we are becoming than anything we might be doing. And that's kind of opposite to the way the world thinks. The world often thinks about visions and goals and all those things are great. But who am I? What am I? What am I becoming as we go forward? Romans tells us that God is committed to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus. And he is more concerned about our character than our comfort. In saying that, we've pointed out also that so often our characters develop when under pressure. Just like a diamond is created with all the pressure of the earth crushes in on that carbon, out comes that beautiful diamond, or just like a pearl inside an oyster is created when grit irritates it. It's in those pressures of life that who we really are, what we really stand for, the things that we think really important begin to surface and come out from us. And of course, God is refining us as the days go by that we are becoming more and more Christ-like. Character is the only thing that can come from our lives by choice, and cooperation with God. We cannot choose what people do towards us or say about us, but we can choose how we respond to that. And our desire is to become like Jesus, right? Today, we're talking about something really important, love, a love worth finding. Love, of course, is the essence of the Christian life. Every Christian knows that. The challenge is that we're living in a world where that word love can mean so many diverse things. We use it so glibly when we say, I love chocolate, I love that movie, I love going to that place. 
Sometimes we, we use it more intentionally when we talk about, I love that person, or I fall in love, or I love her, or love him. But when we come to the biblical Christian God understanding of love, it is something entirely different. I love the story that we've had read to us today from Kings. It's about love in action. Great story how an enemy is fighting Israel and the prophet hears God and gives secret information to the king of Israel to help him. And the story tells us that through providence and divine intervention, the enemy is captured after a moment of blindness. And of course, the king of Israel could have wiped him out. Instead, the prophet says, bless them. Give them food, give them a feast and send them on their way. And that's exactly what's happened. And then we read that that enemy disappeared, at least for a season. Love is very, very powerful. But what does the Bible actually mean when it's talking about love or the love of God? I promise you, it's nothing like the love we talk about in the world. Maybe even as we discuss today, you're going to see something new in this. First of all, just to point this out, we're talking, speaking, preaching in English today. Most of us are English speakers. The English language actually, although it's quite rich, is not as rich as some others. And the New Testament, as you're very aware, was written in Greek. It was actually written in common Greek. But the word that's used for love in the New Testament isn't really available, translatable directly into English. We just have that one word, love. There were at least four words, four Greek words for love uh, in those days when the New Testament was written. They were as follows. There was the word eros. That love was mainly speaking about a love between two people, often referred to as a kind of a sexual love. Sometimes it was used for a love that a person had for a country, like patriotism. But the interesting thing is this, that word eros was never used in the Bible. It was never introduced into the vocabulary of God's word. There was another word for love. I think it's pronounced storge. And it was a kind of familiar love. You know, it's the kind of idea where we sometimes say blood is thicker than water, the love of a family or a community that is tied intrinsically one with another. We could say it's kind of a tribal love. We could say it's a You know, it's a love that has an obligation. You've just got to love and stand by that person. Again, that is a word that's never used in the Bible. We then come across a third word for love, phila or filio. And that's a beautiful word, actually. It means brotherly love, true friends. It's a word that contains affection. You've grown fond of someone. It could be translated to cherish. You know, you really like someone. You have a big heart for them. You just can't wait to see them. Um, It's a warm love. It it comes from your heart. It's, uh, It's reaching towards people. And this word is actually found in the Bible. It speaks about showing brotherly love one to another. Be warm to one another. Engage with one another. Share food with one another. It's actually the same word that was used when it says that Jesus loved Lazarus. He filioed Lazarus. He just had a lot of affection for him. But the word that is commonly used in the New Testament is the word agape. And although it's not exclusively a biblical word, you can't find it in other Greek literature. Predominantly, its setting is the Bible and its home is God, and its conversation is in the church. It's where we find that most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so agape, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. What is, what is this love? In fact, John himself asked the same question in 1 John 3, 1. He said, behold, what kind of love is this that the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? So let's take a moment to look at this love, to maybe dissect it and analyze it a little and to see how profound it is and how it can impact our lives and our community. 
Here's the first thing that might shock you. Agape love does not start in the heart. It doesn't start with emotion. It doesn't start with feelings. And it doesn't even start with affection. This word agape or agape love actually starts in the head or better still, in the mind. In other words, it's primarily not an emotion. It's primarily not a feeling. And it's primarily not a sentiment. Watch this. Agape love is a choice and it's a decision. And it's the principle by which God lives. So much so, the Bible says that he is love. God is love. And so when the Bible speaks about love, agape love, it is not in the first place talking about affection or emotion or heartfelt things. It's actually talking about a decision that has been made, a choice that has been arrived at. God chose to love us. So when the Bible says, for God so loved, it doesn't mean he had a gushy feeling in his heart one day. It simply says that God has chosen to love you. God has chosen to love me. And the undergirding value of love in the scriptures and anything to do with God is this. Love is not a passing emotion. Love is a choice. We choose to love. We ought to and we should choose to love God. The Bible tells us that we should love God with all our souls, all our hearts, all our strength, all our mind. He created us. We choose to love one another. We choose to love our neighbors. We even choose to love our enemies, which does not come natural to any human being. And as we unpack this, we begin to realize that the choice starts in a decision in the mind, but it then very quickly moves the heart and the passions to go along with it. The appropriate affections and the appropriate emotions do tend to follow, but it first begins with a choice. As we unpack this concept of love, we realize it's actually hugely sacrificial and costly because God chose to love us with nothing expected in return. It's easy to love someone when you know you can get something back, right? It's a mutual agreement, a mutual arrangement for the benefit of both. Some people view marriage in that way. But when God chose to love you, he saw you, he knows your name, he knows your situation, he knows your circumstance, and he's chosen to love you regardless of who you are or what you have done. It's also a love that is not self-seeking. God hasn't loved us because for some reason he needs us. He's complete in himself. And here's the thing that I value perhaps the most about God's love. It's a deep, unending commitment. Jesus on one occasion said that he would never leave us nor forsake us. God will never leave us. God has made commitment. There's a stronger word in the scriptures. It's covenant, covenant love. And the Old Testament word was chesed, God's loving kindness. His covenant love is a choice he's made. He's committed to it. He's standing by it and he's working it towards you and to me. And so as we begin to think, wait a minute, if this kind of love is a choice and not a feeling primarily, there's some things we need to understand about this love. First thing is this, this kind of love, this kind of choice, this agape is the basis for all relationships. In fact, it's the basis for the relationship within God himself. God exists in Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God in three personalities. But when we read the scriptures, we find things like this. God loves the Son by choice and agape. In John 17, 24, Jesus said this, you loved me, you agaped me before the foundation of the world. And the Son, Jesus loves the Father in such a fashion. We read 
from the same chapter, for God, but so that the world may know that I love the Father. And it's the same kind of love that God in his Trinity is loving us with. It's the basis for the relationship in God's existence. That's why the Bible says God is love. Then we discover that this love, whilst being offered, must be received. You see, God loved the world, not just my part in it or my part of it or my clan or my race or my people or in this place at this time. God loved the world. He loves everybody within it. God's love is on offer to all he has chosen to love, but that love has to find a landing strip. It has to be received. And the thing is this, so often when we have a conversation about love of any kind, it's always focused through the lenses of our own experience. We can say that God is a loving father, but if you've never known a loving father, that lens will affect the way that you see that. So many people reject love that comes towards them. We had a situation around the church here at one time. There was a man who came to know Jesus in prison. He'd been there for many years, 15 years, I think, for a very serious crime. He came to know Jesus in prison. And as the time came for him to be released, the chaplain who was encouraging him said, now, you must go and find a church to support you, encourage you. So he came out and went and found a regular church. He sat in a pew one day and began to talk to people. And they began to hear his story. The only thing was that the lady sicked in next to him, began to pick up their handbags and move up the pew. He found himself isolated. He never found himself invited to anybody's home. So he attended a community, but never became part of the community. He did this several times with several different churches and he got really fed up with church. One day he prays to the Lord and he says, I don't think much about your church. I can't find much love in it. But he felt the Holy Spirit pressing him to keep persevering. So one day he turned up at our church. And as he turned up at the church, he decided he was going to make it a known fact from the moment he stepped in that he was out of prison and if they were going to reject him, they could reject him right there. So he says to the steward on the door, hi, my name is, and I found Jesus in prison. And the steward on the door said, what was he in for? And of course, this young man then realized maybe this is a place that I could find a spiritual home in as he smiled at that sense of humor. But we have to accept that love. We have to receive that love. And no matter how difficult or tough, love, uh, tough life has been for you, God loves you with a committed decision. Regardless of where you've been or what's been done to you or what you've done, God loves you and he wants you to receive that love. Then this love, this agape love must be imbibed. What do I mean by that? It has to find a home within us. You see, Sometimes, and even in a conversation like this, we say, look, as a Christian, we've got to love like God loves. But the truth is this, it's actually impossible. We can't love like God loves, but this is what God does. He comes to live in us by the Holy Spirit, and then it's his love in us that shines through. Paul said two things in Corinthians. On one occasion, he said, the love of Christ compels us. I can't stop telling people about Jesus. And on another occasion, he said the love of Christ constrains us from behaving in a, in a fashion that offends people. It constrains us. How is that possible? The love of Christ has taken resident, residence in our heart by the Spirit of God. And then the love of God, the agape love of God must be walked. So if it's in us and it's trying to come through us, how do we walk it. And where do we walk it? And with whom do we walk it? Well, the Bible makes it clear that there are multiple levels at which this love must be walked. Firstly, I must receive it to me and walk in it towards me. We read in Jude, only one chapter in that book, verse 21, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Keep yourself in the love of God. You know, the devil's a bad devil. And one of his biggest tricks on us as Christians is to pour in condemnation. You're useless. You're not making it. You're nothing like Jesus. You just keep messing up. 
Nothing's going to happen for you. God's not going to answer your prayers. Why should he do something for you? But you know, the Bible says, keep yourself in the love of God. You know, God is for me. He chose to love me. He made a choice. And as he's made that choice, he made that choice with not depending upon anything that I do or don't do. I'm going to believe his promises that they were given to me because of love. I'm going to believe his word because it's rooted in his love. I'm going to believe he's with me. I'm going to keep walking in the love of God into everything that he has for me. Then that love must be walked in what the Bible calls the brotherhood, meaning the church community. In 1 Peter 2, 17, it says, respect everyone. Love the family of believers or love the brotherhood, one translation says. Fear God and respect the king. Bearing in mind that love, agape, is a choice. Then I come into a community of believers. And if your community of believers is like our community of believers, it's diverse, right? There's all kinds of people in the church. At the last count, here there was something like 70 different nationalities, all kinds of social economic groups, all kinds of experiences, all kinds of abilities, all kinds of stories. Some people are like me. Some people are nothing like me. But you know what the Bible says? Agape is a choice. I choose to love the brotherhood. I choose to love that church and everybody inside it. It's not a question of whether I feel like it or don't feel like it. It's a choice that God's made to me and I then make in return. And do you know what? It's a covenant love. And if I'm becoming like Christ, I'm continually making that choice. The Bible then says, watch this, that that love of God inside me needs to be extended to my family. I know we all get married, right? Because we say we love one another. I'm grateful that I've been married to Sue now 41 years. Some friends of ours recently celebrated their golden wedding, 50 years of loving each other. But all too often, that isn't the case in the world, is it? Divorce is at its highest level, apparently, in history. And then there are others who are still together, but the love is long gone from the marriage or from the home. But you know what? Even natural love between a man and his wife and the parents and the kids can be transformed when agape love begins to touch it. In Ephesians 5, 25 to 33, it goes through a list like this. Husbands, love your wives. Not on Valentine's Day, not just with roses and boxes of chocolates, but just as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? With a choice. I'm choosing to love my wife. I'm choosing to love her, whether I feel it like it in that moment or not, whether something she's doing is driving me crazy or not. I'm choosing to love. And then it works through about parents loving kids and kids loving parents. It's a great passage to read, but it's talking about the love of God. Is agape love in your marriage? Is agape love in your parenting? Not just filia, not just natural, not just tribal, not just family, agape love. If it is, that family is enhanced. The husband leads the home with spiritual authority, looking for God's blessing into his wife and into his kids. The wife will submit to her husband and listen to him and not think that submission is a dirty word, but it's a great privilege to be a partnership together. The parents will love their kids and not exasperate them, but encourage them to grow in the things of God. And the, and the kids in return will respect their parents, even if they don't agree with what they are saying or think that they're 100 years out of date. Agape love changes homes. It changes families. And sometimes as Christians, we simply live at filial level when God wants us to live at agape level. And don't forget what our key point is today. God's love is a choice. Then the Bible says we had to love our neighborhood. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 19, 19 says. Your neighbor is anyone who is in need around you. And boy, there is so much need today, you can't go a day without meeting somebody like that. And how about this one? Even love your enemies. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. 
Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What does it mean to love your enemy? Well, it at least means the following. Don't retaliate. And social media is full of retaliation. I hate you and I'm going to hate you back. I'm going to trash you and I'm going to trash you back. I'm going to slander you. I'm going to slander you back. Whatever they say or do, the Bible says, do not retaliate. It even goes further when it talks about loving our enemies. It means do them no harm. Wish them no harm. Pray for them that they might know the grace of God just like you and I know it. I don't think loving your enemies actually means to allow evil to continue. Because if I allow evil to continue in one person, it's harming another that I'm also supposed to be loving. I don't think it means to let evil go unchecked and so it becomes rampant in the world. You know the famous adage or saying, all that's needed for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. And so love sometimes motivates an action against evil things. So I don't think loving your enemy means let anything go. But when it comes to a personal response from my personal heart, it must mean there's no hatred. I'm not bitter. I'm not envious or covetous towards you. I'm, I'm just trying my best with God's love inside me to love you going forward. And then finally today, if the love is to permeate those areas, it must also be lived out. How is this love lived out? There's a few things the Bible points out for us. Love, if it's God's love, if it's agape love, will always love truth. In Ephesians 4, 15, we read, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. You see, love doesn't get involved with the darkness of deceit, the slanderous accusations, the lies and the things which are not true. It loves the truth. Jesus in one occasion said, I am the truth, the way and the life. Love also, when it's lived out, will hold Christians together. You know, church splits are horrendous. But if we loved, we wouldn't walk away. We read this in Philippians 2, verse 2. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. You see, agape is a choice. I have to choose to not walk away, just to keep standing in that relationship. If love is to be lived, love also, watch this, controls liberties. There might be all kinds of things that you feel totally at liberty in doing, but on occasion, some of the things we might be doing, we feel totally free about, but to others, they can get offended by it. Some Christians drink alcohol, some do not. Some Christians eat pork, some do not. Some Christians keep one Sabbath day very holy and very special and really set apart, some do not. I may be feeling free in all of the above, but if I'm fellowshipping with a Christian who has something that's important to him, I can contain and curtail my liberty for their benefit and for their sake. Love also, watch this, and this might apply to you particularly today. It gives you the right to ask another Christian for help. In Philemon, only one chapter in that book as well, and in verse 9, Paul who wrote it is asking for help. Actually, not for himself, but for a runaway slave. A runaway slave he met whilst in prison. And this runaway slave became a Christian. Paul's encouraged him to go back to his master, who's also a Christian. And Paul's writing to his master and saying, look, actually, I've blessed you. You've come to know Jesus because of me. Your home's been blessed. I'm sending this guy back to you. Bless him and receive him, not just as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. And you know, the Christian family with love sometimes means, could you help me help him? We have a huge need in India right now. Could you help me help them, the orphans and the orphanages and the pastors? 
We have a need in some parts of this city. Could you help me help them? That's how love works. And then as we wrap up today, that love, it's a gap love, this choice has to be focused in the right direction because it is possible to have a gap love, but it locks in to the wrong thing. See, if a gap love is primarily a choice that is then followed by affections, I could actually choose to love the wrong thing and my affections will soon follow. Jesus told us, love not the world. What does that mean to love the world? Well, it means, simply put, don't get so enamored with things, stuff, prestige, and position that it diverts you from eternity and all that God's got for you. There were certain Pharisees that came to be followers of Jesus as he walked this earth, but they became secret disciples because John writes and tells us that they loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. Finally and ultimately, it doesn't matter what they think, it's what God thinks. This love, if it's to be walked, should always be ready to forgive and attempt to restore. And this love is also the motivation for anything in faith. You know, we should live by faith, believing God, trusting God, standing on those promises. But love and faith are twins that walk together. That love causes growth in the Christian. What I want you to see above everything else today is this, that when God talks about love, it isn't an emotion. It isn't what you feel. It isn't simply what you like. It isn't simply who we get along with or what conveniently suits us. It's a choice. And God chose to love us at great expense by sending his precious and only son, Jesus. If we love God, we will love what God loves. And he loves his son passionately. Do we love Jesus too? God loves the church passionately. Do we love the church as well? God loves lost humanity. Do we love lost humanity? You know, when the love of God is touching our hearts, the fear of God is right alongside it, surprising as that may sound. Let me just conclude with two quick stories. I have a friend who I haven't seen for quite some time, I have to admit, Stanley Nadovi, a powerful pastor in Malawi. Before he became a Christian, he almost died. He was bitten by a black mamba snake, which is deadly. And once you're bitten, you're dead. There's no hope for you. He was bitten by the snake. He was close to a hospital and they rushed him into a hospital, but his body was already closing down and he was going into paralysis. He was dying. His mother was a Christian and prayed for him. As he lay there expecting any moment to die, the doctors around him expecting him to die, he just didn't die. And the hours went by, then a few days, and he began to recover and made a full recovery. He got healed from a deadly snake bite. You would think he'd be jumping up and down, celebrating and rejoicing. His story is that it suddenly dawned on him that if God could save his life, God could take his life, and the fear of God came on him. The outcome is that he came to know Jesus, recognized his sin and accepted Christ as his savior, and it become a powerful ministry for the gospel. Likewise, my late friend, Peter Pretorius, his story to faith tells us that he was a, a God cursing, Bible-hating, world-living man. And his dad, who he loved passionately, had a heart attack and was at death's door on life support and about to die. He realized there was no hope for his dad, so the doctors had said, and he remembered he had a Christian cousin. He phones this cousin and said, pray for my dad. The cousin does, and remarkably, dad makes a full recovery. Peter had the same experience as Stanley. If God can save life, God can take life. And the fear of God came on him. He encountered the love of God, but at the same time, he encountered the fear of God. And he handed his life over to Jesus and lived a most remarkable life, affecting millions and millions of people. You see, God made a choice to love us because the consequences of not being loved or responding to that love have eternal, catastrophic results. But when we respond to that love and realize God loved us, which was nothing to do with us, we are saved and come into God's family. This conversation is really important. And I'm praying that God by his Holy Spirit will give both you and me revelation on it. 
Maybe today you need to know Christ for yourself. Maybe you don't know that love intimately, personally. You don't know what it is to be a part of God's family, saved from your sins on your way to heaven with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm asking you right now, is that something you would like? Come on. If it is, would you stop a moment and pray with me? Would you do that? God is right there with you, wherever you may be. You may be the other side of the planet. You may be listening in time or you may be listening on demand, but I want to tell you that God's right there with you. I'm going to pray a prayer. Would you reach out and grab this prayer and make it your own? Make it your own prayer. Ready? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me. You chose to love me. It was a choice that you made. And I am so responding to that love today. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Would you come into my heart? Forgive me for my sins. Bring me into your family and into your eternal home. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Transform me and change me by your Spirit. Teach me to walk in your word and your ways. Lead me from this point forward. I thank you that when I pray like this, you hear me. Amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer or reaching out and grabbing it, we'd like to help you. We have some folks online today who'd be ready just to be there and chat with you. And you can click on the tab which says request prayer if you're on the church online platform. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, get on the link. Somebody will be right there with you. Or if you're watching on demand later, drop us a line. We'll be right back in touch with you. We'll talk a bit more about this next time. I'm praying for you. Don't forget, don't forget. If you do have a need, you reach out and say, can you help me? Here's a praying for you. Email address on the screen. Drop us a line and we'll get right on it. Until next time, God bless. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still in dawn. Come on, with one voice, oh praise, oh praise the name of the Lord.
that you've been blessed with our time together. If you've responded for salvation, please connect with the leaders that are online right now just for you, and they'll help you take your next steps. If you would like prayer or encouragement, again, please connect in the way that's shown there for the leaders to chat with you. Have a wonderful week. We do things all week long here at Destiny. Check out the website and it will show you how you can be involved. Have a very blessed week. We love you. See you again soon. Hi, and welcome to another edition of what's coming up this month at Destiny. Serving is a part of our church's DNA. The head of our church, Jesus Christ, set the example when he was here on this earth. And there was a time, if you remember in Mark, when the disciples were arguing amongst them, who's the greatest? And Jesus told them quite clearly that anyone who wants to be the greatest among you must become the least and servant of all. It says quite clearly here in Ephesians 4, for his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected. Every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body when we are built up and made perfect in love. When everybody's contributing, the body is perfected and grows. There's one area of ministry we are needing people in and that's stewarding. You know, stewarding is so important. They are the gatekeepers to the house. They are the people who ensure that that meeting runs in the way that God intended it to, by inviting people in, by showing them to their chairs, by protecting the environment within the meeting, and by just making it safe. So let's sign up today. we have the awesome opportunity to gather together outside our city centre building here in Glasgow and to let people know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be the best kept secret in this city. We want everyone to know that we're there for them, that they can come and join us, that we are family. They are just waiting to meet. So come and join us 
it will be the end of a freshest week. There'll be lots of activity, lots of buzz, lots of things going on, and we need you and we want you to be there with us. Following our church on the street, on the Sunday the 18th, we are all together, one in worship. We had an awesome time last month meeting together in the Shorelands location and just enjoying the presence of God as one big body. And we're gonna be doing the same again. Sunday the 18th of September, noted in your diaries, Shorelands location, South Side, be there. We have the exciting opportunity to meet together for our family forum. If you're a part of the family here at Destiny, you are invited. This is where we come together to chat and see what's happened in the ministry, in the church over the last few months and to hear about the vision of where we're going. Sunday the 25th of September, our According to the Pattern, which is our foundation teaching course on what Christianity is and who we are and what we believe as a church, starts. And we're welcoming you, if you've never done that course before, to sign up and attend. It's a fantastic time of fellowship. It's a time where you can speak to the leaders and hear exactly what we as a church believe. For more details, visit our website. God bless you. We love you.